A heart rendering video call between two ladies went viral at the weekend. In the video call, one of the ladies narrates our ordeal in the hands of Boko Haram terrorists. She speaks of the horror of abduction and rape multiple times by terrorists. So horror. Wallahi it's a lie. It don't have any command. The 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 yom al kiyama. Allah mm -hmm. ina gana gish when I was in captivity. I saw that. I saw yeah, horror. Yeah. I still yeah. have nightmares. Bad nightmares. I say arik ina hayo hargo be. I can horror send them again. I can horror send them again. That's why I left Nigeria. That's why I'm here. But wallahi it's a lie. If you have not been through what we've been through, a lot of us that have been in captivity and been raped multiple times by terrorists you would not know you would not know the pain you would not know the agony nobody stood nobody believed me nobody said anything the lady in the video is Hafsad Mena Mohammed a married woman mother of six children an indigenous of Gwoza local government area in Boronu state before her abduction Hafsad worked as a full-time journalist in Kano for Pyramid FM Liberty Radio TV FRCN and uh, Kaduna and uh, Freedom Radio Jigawa State. Hafsat was forced to flee Nigeria for the United States after her release from captivity, and she worked briefly for the Voice of America in Washington, D.C. Today, like a few women in northern Nigeria, she has decided to speak out to bring attention to the horrendous crimes being perpetrated against women and children in that region in the hope that the government and international community takes decisive action to end the onslaught. Now joining us from a base in Prince George count country, county I should say, Maryland, USA, is Hafsat Maina Mohammed. Good morning, Hafsat, and thanks for joining us on the morning show. Hafsat, good. Uh, uh, thank you so much this morning for your bravery and courage to share your experience because it takes a lot. Uh, what was it like? What was the story like? How were you kidnapped? How did you get in the den of Boko Haram? Good morning. Um, I remember traveling along the way and um, along the way of Goza, coming back to Medugri, I was doing um, uh, my humanitarian work that I did, um, going around helping people. I came back safely that day and um, I proceeded to Yobe State where um, I had other things to do. Um, suddenly, as I walked into the neighborhood, uh, which, well, I lived like not far from the forest or from, you know, a, a, a civilization. Um, I heard this young girl scream. I heard this young girl scream and um, this is the same young girl that, you know, um, when we got captured, she was in captivity. She's only nine years old, as old as my daughter, as a den. And I heard her screaming in an uncompleted building as I walked silently trying to get home. And um, this was after the escape. So we were walking, we were walking, um, you know, we rested. It wasn't just me. And um, this, this young girl, you know, she has energy. She was running, she was running until after she had, she was ahead of us and she got caught again by another group of the Boko Haram terrorists. And I've been saying a long time ago that there are factions of Boko Haram. So it's not just, you know, like one group entirely, they are factions of them. So I don't know which faction that was, but this girl was in their hands and it was about six of them. They were about to rape her. They were about to do whatever they were about to do. And I heard her and I traced the voice. Uh, the other ladies and the young guy were telling me, just keep going, just keep going. They might kill you because you're older than her and you, you, you're trying to intervene. But the cry I heard was just a cry of my own child. She's only nine for crying out loud. Why, why, do they, why are they trying to inflict pain on their poor child? Uh, I took the bull by the horn. Um, I don't know if it was the right or wrong decision. I wasn't thinking. I I found, I traced them. 
you know, in that uncompleted building in the in the midst of nowhere. And um, I told her to run. As soon as I got the attention on me, I told her to run. I told her to run. And she, I, I told her, Kibudu. I said, Kibudu, kawai. that's the only thing I can remember myself saying, Kibudu, just run. And then, of course, they turned on me and they took turns one after the other, one after the other until they were done. In short, that I was battered enough that I couldn't walk that very minute. I laid there. I don't know if I fainted. I don't know what happened to me. I laid there in that uncompleted building until, you know, I heard the call of prayer. And that's what woke me up. And as I woke up, uh, I got myself up. I walked. I walked slowly. I, I was bruised. I was wounded. I was hurt. I was bleeding. I walked slowly into, you know, to, to where the others were because it was dark. It was late. It was getting dark when we were walking. So I knew that, that, that we had already planned that we would just rest when we find a space and they were resting. I knew the path of where we were going or where I left them at. Um, I walked back to where they were. I found a, a young guy waiting for me. He told me the other ladies had left because he told them to leave. The other two ladies have left with the other with the uh, nine year old, and uh, he carried me on his back, and we walked. He walked, and we walked until we, you know, got into town. Um, so yeah, that's what happened. The next day, well, we went to the hospital, and um, they treated my wounds, uh, gave me uh, anesthetics. And uh, they told me to go back home since I was in danger because the hospital's unsafe as well. And this is um, this is not far, not too far from Yobe, not too, far, you know, in between Yobe and Brno State. So um, I slept um, through the next day. I healed. I got better uh, gradually. After three, four days, I left that area and went back to my destination. Uh, to my home, which was in Yobi at then. Uh, well, my sister's home, I call it my home. And I stayed there, my cousin, um, and I healed. She didn't know what happened to me. She just thought, you know, I'm just activist that always, you know, goes to the bush and helps people after a bomb blast. She just thought I got wounded by the trees and whatever. I didn't tell her nothing. I didn't tell anybody anything because I was not about to be stigmatized uh, already, I'm, I've been stigmatized by the work I do. I was not about to be, you know, further stigmatized. So I kept it to myself. I remember going to the police and they told me to stay safe, uh, sadly. And that was it for me. Um, I was hurt. I, I, I was in pain. But at that time, I moved to, I, I had gone, to, I was back and forth to, uh, from uh, Yobe, Kaduna, and Abuja doing my activism. So I went to Kaduna, stayed there a while, and continued my work as if there was nothing wrong with me. Um, I also went to Abuja. At that time, I was working also um, a little bit with uh, uh, USAID and consulting with them. So I was just doing my thing working until after... I was stalked again in 2015 by Boko Haram. This incident uh, of me being raped happened in 2013. I was stalked again in 2015 by Boko Haram. Uh, I was continuously stalked. I was living in Yobe permanently at this time. And on my way to Bochi, I had threats. Uh, a ragged older guy was telling me, we're watching you. We're watching you. We know where you're going. We see where you're going. We see what you're doing. It's only a matter of time and we will kill you. And this was in a public uh, uh, like transportation area or whatever. And I was in a public transportation bus going to Bochi for a meeting. And another person also came to me and said, uh, he advises me to eat whatever I want to eat because it's just a matter of time. As we And I got really scared. I got really scared. And I told the bus guy, I said, how much is the whole bus? He said, this is how much it is. And I told him, you know what? I'll pay for it. Just go. 
Um, so as we drove off, not far from the uh, garage, then a bum blast. There was a bum blast, not too far as we drove off, or as we drove out. Turned around, I saw fire, I saw smoke, and that did it for me. That, that, that really did it for me. Um, I went to Bochi and um, told my ordeal. I was flown to Abuja um, and then kept somewhere safe. And we went to make a report at the headquarters there in Abuja, the police headquarters. And um, sadly, we were brushed off, or should I say I was brushed off. And it was like just another normal complaint for them that they decided not to look deep into or to give regards to. Um, so from there, I, they started my process to fly me out to come here to the U.S. and be safe. So that's a summary of it, really. Okay, Afsat. Well, I mean, quite a moving story there. But could you tell us about, one, the NGO that you run, the program that you are involved in, uh, in some great detail, and secondly, your assessment of how the Nigerian government has been dealing with this, you know, uh, challenge of abduction, the effect on the school system, and also the security uh, situation in the country. Okay, uh, the, the, the NGO I started uh, called Choice for Peace, Gender, and Development, um, it was because of that little girl and because of my own child or my own children that I would bear years after or, you know, in the future. I thought of them as, you know, girls really not having a choice, especially in where the part I come from, northern Nigeria. We really don't have a say. We don't have a choice. The stigmatization on everything we do is really heart wrenching. And the fact that if we if we complain or or try to talk about our ordeal, be it gender based violence, be it uh, uh, being raped, be it um, molestation, be it whatsoever, be it, um, um, what do you call it, being bullied at work as a female, as a journalist uh, in, in northern Nigeria, I remember being bullied a lot by my colleagues and whatever. Um, I remember being sidelined, even though I was very qualified and capable for a particular show or whatever, I remembered being sidelined and so on and so forth. So we not being able to speak up really was so hurtful. It was something that was hurting my soul deep down. It was something that I would go on and I'm like, oh, just another day of me maybe going through something and I can't even talk about it. This is how I came about Choice for Peace, Gender and Development. And when I say gender, I'm not just talking about, well, mostly I'm talking about the female gender, but I'm also talking about the male as well, especially the young guy who is just trying to make it in life honestly and is being targeted or bullied or reduced to nothing. So I created the NGO to give people a chance to speak up, to give you know organizations, international community, a chance to actually do research on how bad stigmatization is of women, young girls, and young men who are really, really doing nothing but trying to live an honest, good life um, in the midst of the Boko Haram insurgency at that time, which you know proceeded to also you know, going beyond that. I mean, right now, I've calmed down with that because I'm not in Nigeria. Basically, my work is in Nigeria, going to communities and serving and asking questions and recording data, so on and so forth. So from where I am, it is really hard to maintain that, uh, that pace, but I'm still trying as much as I can to get enough data to get women to speak out to tell them it's okay, you know, it's really okay. I found my voice amidst everything. I found my voice. One thing I know I am happy about with this NGO is that my father, when he heard about it, he believed me. He did not tell me I was lying. He did not discard my story. He believed me and he supports me and he prays for me. That kept me going. That has been something that's been like a powerhouse for me the fact that my dad believes me, the fact that somebody really hears me, you know? So that was the whole aim of uh, Society for Peace, Gender and Development. Now, uh, 
the next question was about um government uh, government efforts what's about government effort like i told you after my ordeal um and i've had encounters with police and the government um so on and so forth even 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 as going down to the state level with legislators and senators we've you know come up with bills about hate speeches and hate crimes remember i remember that doing that in kaduna with a particular ngo but you know it, i don't understand why it is so hard for the masses in the society to have a listening ear or to have a document read and, 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 and for them to go through a document that is really going to help the society. I also remember we created a program in Kaduna for the youth. Um, it, was, it was a long shot. It was as simple as them playing sports. It, we didn't need anything. All we needed was equipment, and we didn't have personal money to um, have the, that equipment. Me living in the international community or the U.S. and traveled outside of the country a lot way before I came to the U.S., I've seen how government effort is being put. If it's even even though it's not perfect, even though it's not a hundred percent, but I've seen how government effort is being put in place. You know, at least to um, relieve people of their, of their worries, of their complaints, of, of jobs, of, 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 of justice, of accountability. The Nigerian government lacks accountability. And I'm not just talking about now, I'm talking, and I'm not talking just about the presidency. I'm talking about, I'm talking about the senators. I'm talking about the legislators. We elect them, we vote them, we put them in those offices, yet we have no right to ask them questions. Yet we have no right to say, this is going on. We need you to be in your constituency. We need you to really look into this. They don't, we, we can't even request that. We cannot have that as citizens. It's, it's really disgusting. It's, it's unacceptable. It isn't fair. It isn't fair. We are living in a democracy. We're not living in a dictatorship. So why don't we have a voice? Why can't we be heard? Why can we protest peacefully when we do not agree with something? Why do we have to always say, yes, sir, yes, ma'am, just like Fela Song that says zombie or zombie. We, we don't have to live in such a manner. And we don't have to accept it. Well, have sat. Well, good morning. Uh, good morning. Lord. First, I'd like to commend you for your courage in bringing uh, attention to these horrendous crimes being perpetrators against us women by these terrorists. Now you're presently in the United States and you, seek, you went to seek refuge there, is that correct? Yes. Now in that video, you talked about how there are no uh, you know, refugee situations for victims of Boko Haram. Can you share with yes. us details of your advocacy? Because I have seen through your Instagram that you are advocating for victims such as yourself to you know, get this type of refugee situation that you have at this point. Yes. And um, I will tell you that uh, there is a law, the, 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 the VAP law here in the United States that allow for people who have been in domestic violence or situations like that, refugees coming in, can seek protection and stay in the United States. But what I'm talking about basically is that even the women like if you do not have somebody by your side who knows, you know, what to do and is educated to guide you on saying you can seek refuge here or you can go here. And I'm talking about refuge, refugees uh, around the world and us like victims going around the world seeking refuge. I, I, I know of a couple of people who have sought refuge because of this um uh, insurgency that happened, you know, in the northeastern part of Nigeria and other places. But it's just a few of us. It's just like three out of a hundred. Now, and 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 I can really, I can really beat my chest and tell you, I'm the only house of person that I know from the north, like uh, 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 from the southern part of Brno, that I know that has sought refuge to stay here, you know, amidst what happened to me. I've not seen many refugees come from that part of the country um, seeking refugee to be protected from what happened to them, you know, further as more seeking help in getting better or being healed by the trauma we face every day. You see what I'm saying? 
So I haven't seen it. I've, I've, I've looked, I've searched, I've asked questions, I've gone round. I've, I, I have the privilege of knowing a lot of council people here and I don't see it. I don't know if it's because they don't want to seek for it, that they are feeling that stigmatization again, you know, to say, this is my story. This is what happened to me. Um, I don't know if it's that. And, I, you know, and I'm really trying to call on women to seek refuge, if, it, if it's not in America. You know, if you feel, I felt as though I had to leave. I had to leave because I knew I was suicidal. I, and I can't say this as a northerner freely and say, this is what, this is my disease. This is the disease I've had, being suicidal after all of this um, Boko Haram situations that I've been into, being suicidal just at the mere fact that I had to take in a lot of babies that were born after a bomb blast, seeing all of that in my dreams and stuff like that. So it, it's really sad that it's not just me. I'm sure there are many women out there who maybe are not as educated as I am, but still, they still went through horror. They, they still had nightmares. I know a couple of women in northeastern part of Nigeria who committed suicide after they were attacked by Boko Haram, raped, or so on and so forth. You know, I know a lot of IDP young ladies who thought, who didn't even know they could seek re refuge outside the country and, and survive, they went back to their captors. They went back to Boko Haram, even after being rescued. It, it's sad because this is the life that they are going to make normal uh, and, and they are going to continue to be brainwashed that um, this is how you should live. I do not understand why it's okay for uh, the manly world to tell a woman who's also created by God equally that this is how we should live. You know, I've had this and maybe that's why I didn't fit in in Northern Nigeria. I've had it ever since when I was growing up as a child to be an independent thinker. I don't know why that is such a big problem, you know, and um, this is the problem we have with refuge, um, seeking refugee, maybe in the UK or wherever as a Northerner, and um and 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 people women just don't do it men may do it but women i'm telling you it's just a number it's just a few number of us like they don't even pursue it to the latter they give up you know when they could be somewhere and be safe and heal what i'm saying is even if you don't want to stay in that country for the rest of your life but at least go somewhere secured and somewhere that you can get help from because nigeria is not providing that help we don't have those amenities to say, okay, this is re this is a trauma center, a trauma hospital that is just catering for trauma victims, PTSD uh, victims. We do not have stuff like that that really is in-depth, even though we have a lot of psychologists who are very, very, very professional in whatever they do. But can we really say this is a trauma hospital where, you know, the make or say, on the street, maybe she's been battered by her husband and has and has seven children, and she's you know frying akara on the street, but she still lives with that trauma. Can she freely walk into that center and say, "Hey, I need help"? Hmm. You know. Many, so this many, is many questions you're raising this morning. You know, and while you were saying all of that, what was just spinning in my head was, where do the broken hearts? from this book where go. this urgency go? You know, where, where do they, do they really find their way home? I doubt. No, they don't. You know, they don't. It's, it's, they don't. They don't find their way home. And that is what is hurting me <laughs> because it's going to be something that my society, not just the northern part of Nigeria, is going to be something that our young girls will live with for the rest of their lives. I am battling it right now. I'm happy in another form. I have my family. I have a supportive husband. I have kids. But every day when you think about those little girls who are motherless, who the government is ignoring and are not getting enough help, wallahi, wallahi, it's hurtful. And that's why I get re-traumatized because I'm connecting to them on a personal base. 
Even if it's not happened to you, like, don't we have a heart? Don't, don't, aren't we empathetic anymore? Aren't we human? How are we humanizing things that aren't human, but we are not humanizing somebody who's been a victim and traumatized? Let me cry. Let me feel my pain. Let me heal without you stigmatizing me or calling me a liar or, 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 or castigating me in my society. Let me be, let me live. The way I would live and have a fruitful life is by being healed, is by talking about my trauma, is by getting the help I need. How many young girls or women or young men or men are going to seek help and have help? How many? Well, Asat, I like your point about trauma care and also about counseling. Uh, it's something we push all the time when we deal with this kind of topic on this program. But I'd like to ask you, for purposes of clarification, uh, what you went through, was it a combination of abduction and rape, or abduction or rape? And then, you know- Abduction been, and rape. Both, okay. We've been talking about seeking refuge abroad and all that, the simple word is exile. But it's not everybody that will have the opportunity to go on exile. So what do you okay. say to those young persons uh, who have gone through a similar experience and who may not have the benefit of the kind of option uh, that you have chosen? That's a hard question to answer because what would I say to them? What, what would I say to them? I would tell them there's power in their voices and they need to speak up. Uh, <clears throat> Um, I need to breathe because I'm getting really emotional. Um, but there is power in their voices because when they speak up is when they can find help. I'm telling them now, speak up, say something, talk to somebody. Just don't, don't, don't die in silence. We have a lot of crisis going on. It's not just about securing North that I was protesting about at the embassy. It's not just about that. It's about a lot of things, especially the trauma and seeking help. When you seek help, when you say something, you would not know who might help you. And I get that it's dangerous to always speak about it, but we have to say something in such a way that we can get the help we need. Somebody there might be listening to you and you never know what resources the other person have. And I will tell people, educate yourself, study, educate yourself. There, 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 there is the leverage of the internet, a lot of free information on Google. Look for it, see how you need help, see how you can get help, see who can help you, you know? And I will let you know that I am honored that the people who helped me with my asylum when I got here was human rights first in connection with Ballot Spar. Ballot Spar is a law firm who deals with, you know, international refugees. They, If you file through human rights first, they connect you with, their pro bono lawyers, I had not ever paid one dollar. I never paid a dollar to get my asylum. But it's because I was studying, I was, I, 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 I spoke up and I sought help. That's how it happened. And I'm safe I, and I'm secured. I'm getting therapy. I'm, 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 I'm vibrant. I'm living a life that I never thought I would live. Back then, if you tell me that I'd be sitting here today living a life and continue to be an advocate, I'll tell you it's a big fat lie. But I am here because I spoke up and I, I studied and I and I researched and I sought help. Right. Now, Hafsat, you mentioned that uh, you're suicidal. Do you still have those feelings and have you received any form of post-traumatic therapy? And if you have, can you share with us? And what yes. inspired you to put out that video? You're a woman. And I'm sure you've been through things as well. Maybe not what I've been through. Uh, we all have issues um, that makes us or breaks us. As women, we're a powerhouse of emotions and 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 there are things that we are not 
able to just put out there, just as women, it's just who we are. Um, what inspired me to do that video? And, and I will tell you this for the record. I did not even do that video on purpose to say I wanted to, I wanted to be put out there. The person that I was live with, what we've been doing is that ever since we've had all these attacks and the 42 women and children were burnt in the car, in the bus, or uh, in, in Sokoto as they traveled innocently, I started, to, I started to protest immediately the next day at the Nigerian embassy. I've been doing it physically alone. Today would be my seventh day. Um, on the fifth day, I had that young lady, um, Belkis, who joined me, but I've been doing it physically alone. And I've had the other lady on the video, Hawa Mustafa Babura. She's been the one being with me live just to keep me company, just to make sure that I'm okay. And we've been discussing the issues on how to secure North. And thus a story about a young girl came up while we were doing this particular video uh, we had a caller or somebody who joined the live video talking about she's a doctor with orthopedic hospital in Dala. And she was telling us about a traumatic situation about a 13 year old girl who is in their care and has no support whatsoever. Her parents were killed in front of her by the bandits. And as she screamed when she saw her mother and father shot dead, they shot her in her mouth. Right now, as I speak to you, she's still there laying in bed in the hospital with no help. And the family members, everybody is mute. Nobody is giving her support. She's being stigmatized for, for, for being shot, for screaming when her parents were shot, a lot, were, were shot to death right in her present, a 13 year old girl. So this is, that, that's why I think I was connecting with that 13 year old girl. At the age of 13, at the age of 13, I got, molested i i've been molested not by boko haram but by a family member who still till date when i hear or see his name written even if it's not that person i get traumatized and i guess it's been a, a back to back back to back experience for me about rape about molestation and all of that about about being beat up you know, by my ex-husband about, you know, all of that just put together that made me not want to live. It was like, there's nothing more to live for. And up till today, well, today I get PTSD uh, medications and, ter and therapy. I would say it's subsided. Uh, as of two years ago, I had those thoughts like badly, 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 especially when I saw victims who couldn't get help, especially when I fell down. And then I'm like, uh, what am I living for? And I think this is where we need to always find that uh, common ground in ourselves of saying, I need to find something concrete to live for. And in this case, I've, I've told myself that my kids are worth living for. My husband right now is worth living for. I cannot do an injustice to them by feeling like I want to kill myself because of my traumatic experiences. That was just a part in an episode of my life. It might never go away, but you know, healing is one day at a time. Trauma mm. healing, PTSD healing is like a dance. It's not a switch of a light. It's not like a light switch. It's a dance. You keep dancing, you keep dancing, making different moves until you, you know, get, mm. the, get, get comfortable with yourself. Mm. And, you know, and, and as you walk through that journey of healing, you know, we can always wish you, all, all, always wish you the best here, you know. And you just remind me of the words of Rumi that says uh, uh, a wound is what lets the light in. And because of the yeah. wound you have gone through, I'm sure that the light will come into your life and radiate yes. through. I just Thank want you. to ask you this. Recently, spokesperson of the president uh, I mean, uh, Minister of Information, I should say, put a statement out, say things are not that bad in the North, that the government is gaining grounds as regards the fight against the surgeons. You've been there, you've seen the first stand. How bad is it? And what would you like to say 
you know, to the Minister would, of Information. I would like to ask him, how is he coming up with that? Where is his data to say that? People are dying. People are being abducted day by day. I have messages. I have, I don't care if it's not happening to you or it's not happening to your next door neighbor, but the ordinary person traveling on the road, we see it every day in Kaduna. Go to, go to, um, go to the social media, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, tw uh, TikTok, whatever, go online. You will see people posting and people that don't even have social media. They send it personally to other people. This is what's happening. Even yesterday or day before yesterday, two days ago, uh, I was told, I was told a story about three bikes. Only three bikes were successful in stopping over 1000 cars coming along from uh, Abuja to Kaduna Highway. Like, what is he talking about? I expect more from him from a, somebody that's educated and somebody that has, you know, come up with great ideas and things. It's not that bad. But if one soul is gone, if 42 people can be can be burnt alive to ashes with babies, inclusive pregnant women, young, vibrant men. How are you telling me that it's not that serious? How? Is it because you're okay? Is it because you're sitting at the comfort of your home and you can travel abroad and and have the luxury of life? Is that why you're saying it is not it, it is it, 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 it is not that bad? Like I always how my, my I have questions too, Ruben. I'm telling you, I have no answer. All I have for him is questions. How? What is your data? What is your basis of saying it, it it's not that bad? Do you think an innocent soul being killed? It's not that bad. One, even if it's one innocent soul, do you think it's not that bad? Shouldn't, shouldn't there be more security where 42 people can travel safely to their destination without being burnt alive and their babies being burnt alive and pregnant women having to give birth before their due date and dying in the, in the bus? Isn't that bad enough? Well, How we dare he? How dare he? Good point. Thank you very much, Asad, for joining us on the morning show.